I think we can kick off. Uh, so hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Elise, I'm from Hardware Meetup AKL. Um, sorry, someone just asked a question. <laughs> it totally threw me off, but yeah. I'm from Hardware AKL. Uh, we started this event series about four years ago to showcase people building hardware or people with hardware companies in New Zealand or that are interested in products. Um, we've held lots of events, showcased lots of awesome companies now, and tonight we're going to tell the Flamingo story. Um, it's the first event we've ever run online. Um, so fingers crossed, we had a few te technical difficulties just before people jumped on, but um, hoping that it all goes smoothly. Um, so we have one sponsor tonight, which is Propelhead. Um, I'm very lucky to be part of the Propelhead team and very lucky that they support me. Um, we do lots of software for Auckland Transport, so we definitely, like, we love supporting transport stuff. Um, they love supporting it, so yeah, I'm just lucky to be part of the team. Um, so the itinerary for tonight, what's going to happen is we're going to run through the story. Um, there'll be Q and A, there might not be any questions, um, but we'll run a Q and A anyway. Um, and then we will have asks for help. So usually at our in-person events, people will get up in the middle of the event and ask for help and people have got jobs, they've got, um, employees, they've got new opportunities, they've probably raised money. So many things have happened because it's a really unique opportunity to ask for help with people that understand hardware. Even if, you're, even if your question isn't totally hardware related, you could be looking for a job or you could be looking for someone new in the company you're working for. Um, what you can do is put it down in the Q&A. So all throughout the event, if you think of a question or if you haven't asked and you'd like me to read it out, just pop it down in the Q&A and I can read it out um, kind of at, at the end. Cool. Okay. So I think that's it. Um, I think we can get started. So Nick, Jackson, uh, what's Flamingo? Yeah, so Flamingo is a dockless um, e-scooter company, um, Kiwi owned, um, founded by myself, Nick and Jackson here. Uh, we operate about 1,300 scooters across New Zealand's three largest cities. Uh, we started Flamingo back in 2018, and then we began operations in June 2019. So we've been operating for about a year now. Cool. So tell me the story, like right from the beginning, how did you, how did you dream up Flamingo? Like what brought you to the place of starting this company? Awesome. So Nick and I first met at a, um, a startup accelerator program called Venture Up, which is run through Creative HQ, an awesome organization down here in Wellington, who run um, a variety of different startup accelerator programs. Really recommend um, checking them out if you guys haven't heard of them already. Um, and yeah, we were just both really we went through that program together in the same team with a quite a different idea. We were working on um, an app called Crave, which was like the Tinder for food. <laughs> so it helped um, helped groups of friends decide what to have for lunch with nearby restaurants and stuff. Um, but yeah, we really just stayed in touch after Venture Up and sort of um, started working on lots of different startup ideas. We kind of both liked um, the transport and the technology sort of industries. So quite a few different um, startup ideas in that sort of space. And I guess the one that really took off was Flamingo. We <laughs> never looked back. Um, yeah, and I guess I think Nick's probably best place to kind of talk about the initial story of um, Flamingo. So yeah, I guess back in 2018, I was traveling in San Francisco and kind of saw the first e-scooter companies battling it out on the streets there. You know, I thought, we've got to have this in New Zealand, you know. Um, you know, you can see the rising congestion in New Zealand and um, population density increasing. And, you know, a greater focus for sustainability with technology here in New Zealand. So, yeah, thought we had to make a move on that. Cool. So that's like, yeah, where it all began. I do remember going to Paris a couple of years ago and there were so many different e-scooter brands. I was like, oh, this is amazing. There's so many... They're everywhere. There's like five different operators at every street corner, which, you know, it can, if there's heaps of them, you can't walk, but it, it was still cool to see all that. So 
yeah, it sounds like we probably, it was a similar time when they were all like bursting out around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. On top of it here in New Zealand. So, mm. yeah. What, so what next? Like, how did you, you just had the idea? Like, what's the first thing you did? Yeah, so a lot of the work we did right at the start was um, working with NZTA and the local councils just to ensure that e-scooters could be legally operated in New Zealand. So, um, you know, we, we first started working on Flamingo right back before any, any e-scooter um, operator had entered New Zealand. So even before Lime had shown up and bit us to it. Um, so, you know, we were doing a lot of the groundwork trying to um, advocate for the e-scooters to be allowed to operate um, and, you know, kind of work with, the, with both NZTA and local councils to work out where the best place for them to operate would be. Um, so it's, it's quite an interesting, I guess, problem where all around the world, these e-scooter and micromobility has started to take off and every, every different um, council and kind of regulatory body has kind of taken that same problem and dealt with it quite differently. So, um, you know, in some countries they're only allowed to be ridden on the road and then in other countries they're only allowed to be ridden on the footpath. Um, and we ended up being quite lucky here in New Zealand where they're allowed to be operated on both the road and the footpath and also um, not having the, I guess, the strong restriction, strong restrictions around um, helmets or needing to have a driver's license verified through the app. Some, we've been kind of quite lucky in the, um, the environment that we've been allowed to launch in, which is cool. Um, so yeah, right back at the start, it was really working through working through all that and you know I, we remember right at the start talking to um people like the nzta and councils and stuff like oh what, what do you mean like a kid's scooter or a mo moped you know when you say an electric scooter people would think of a you know a moped straight away sort of thing so kind of had to overcome that initial hurdle of um you know no this is what we're talking about <laughs> so how um, did you how did you show them like how did what what did they think when you first showed them like not like when you first showed them the actual thing were they like oh wow that would be amazing or were, were they like oh I'm not sure don't know that looks dangerous I don't really like that yeah I think both kind of parties were a bit reluctant to be the one to first put their hand up and they kind of want to see what would happen in other cities around the world first so yeah it took a lot of you know research and kind of going into it to see how you know, a program like this could work in New Zealand around our laws and work for the people here. Mm. Yeah, because like you mentioned that you had already started before Lime got in New Zealand. So yeah. do you know what Lime did? Did they just come and drop off a whole bunch? Mm. Well, I guess, no, no, they didn't. They, they kind of worked alongside NZTA too. I think maybe they took a little bit more of a um, forceful approach, but the, I guess the key difference with Lime is the second that the law changed, they were ready to go. They had scooters on, the, you know, in New Zealand ready to start operating. And that kind of took us by surprise at the start because um, a lot of the, I guess, you know, our initial idea was that we'd be first to market and that we'd be able to bring e-scooters to New Zealand. And, um, you know, right at the start, we, I, it's funny looking back at the old plans we had to start with, you know, only like 50 scooters in Wellington and just grow it up from there and see test the market see whether um there's demand for it but i guess um having having such big competition and internet you know multi-international players um also interested in new zealand kind of forced our hand and meant that we had to start a lot bigger than we ever thought that we would um and yeah it was sort of a really interesting challenge needing to get up to that scale really quickly so where did you like where did you get the product? Where did you get the scooters? So our first scooter we bought from a cycle shop in Wellington and hand painted it ourselves. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so there were already e-scooters. Yeah. There were already electric scooters around that you could just buy for. Yeah. So right. That is a mock-up example of what scooter sharing would look like. Mm, yeah. yeah. So that was like cool to take to like take it around to the council and be like, this is kind of what we're talking about sort of thing. Um, and it was, yeah, good to have like a live demo um, scooter. And then where did you, so I can see so many scooters. <laughs> did you just hit up like different suppliers? Did you find them through talking to bike shops or how did you find suppliers of, of these? Hmm. So I think um, 
we looked overseas, a lot of the um, e-scooter companies, they're sort of all focused on one or two main suppliers. So, you know, um, that was one of the other things we did right at the start was reach out to different um, e-scooter manufacturers and um, get in touch, kind of see who had a scooter that could be used for e-sharing, what ones we could kind of work with with our um, software and um, integrate into all our applications and stuff. So yeah that i guess that you know that supplier evaluation was one of the first things we did and um it was it sort of ended up being quite an easy choice to go with segway because they're quite a really well-known um and established brand you know everyone knows them from the the segways back in the day which kind of kind of built this credibility which made it um really kind of gave councils and um regulators some comfort when um hearing you know that it's not just some new product that could be risky you know it's a company that's been um developing micro mobility um products for you know almost 20 years sort of thing so um yeah th that's our first first batch of scooters on the slide there um which was such a crazy feeling when they were first first arrived in wellington <laughs> yeah it, it was a lot of work to first get them set up because you know just being a startup we couldn't hit the kind of minimum order quantities of these big companies so for us, they came just as black scooters and we had to, you know, print custom stickers that fit all around them to <laughs> make them look like our own. Cool. Mm. What happened next? Um, so yeah, I guess for us, it was, you know, to get funding in the first place was quite hard to balance. You know, you need a council permit to get funding and then you need funding to be able to get in scooters to get a council permit. So try and balance you know, investors and councils both at the same time and make them both, you know, come along together. <laughs> it was quite a yeah. quite a balancing game, but it all kind of fell into place. And yeah, um, so once we won our first permit, which was in Wellington, um, we had 12 weeks to um, put everything together. So when we won the permit, we didn't have any scooters, any apps, any team, any warehouse. So we had 12 weeks to develop all of our platform get all the hardware here and all set up, hire all of our team, find warehouses and make, yeah, the entire Flamingo just in 12 weeks, which was a, which was a crazy rush, <laughs> but we managed to get it all done. And then, yeah, just focus on improving since then. And yeah, we operate now in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch, which we're pretty proud of. Cool. Um, where did you get the money? <laughs> Yeah, so I guess like what Nick was saying, it was very chicken and egg, like we kind of had to have that um, permit. And so what we ended up doing was kind of um, raising money, I guess, from investors on the basis that we obtained a license. So um, kind of had to have them confirm that they'd be keen if we we're able to get the green light from the license, which I guess gave us the confidence confidence to submit those applications to operate our service. Um, in the three big cities. So we ended up going down a private um, investor route. So very lucky to sort of use our connections that we had from being in the startup space and working in businesses and, um, you know, friends and family who also um, own their own businesses and have contacts to, um, yeah, right, find a small select group of um, private investors who are all quite entrepreneurially minded themselves. So they're all business owners they were able to kind of get behind that dream that we had and that vision um, to bring e-scooters to New Zealand and yeah I think it goes without saying they all had to kind of be a little bit um, risk-taking and business kind of entrepreneurially minded themselves as well. Did you develop the app from scratch? Yep so we got our development thing here and we developed all of our own so we developed all the software for our mobile apps, servers, um, websites, and so on. So the scooters themselves have a IoT, which looks like that, the little black box on the front. And that's made by Segway and pretty much communicates events from the scooter that then interact with all of our software and mobile apps that we made. Right. Cool. Yeah. What's next? <laughs> so yeah, I guess since then we've been kind of focusing on innovating. So we've launched our second generation scooter up in Auckland, which is a bit more sturdier and um, built for sharing. Uh, we've been 
learning from our data. So collect a lot of data from where scooters go. So we can be able to generate heat maps, which we share with councils and so on. And then yeah, really focusing on safety. I think for us is quite a balance between, you know, our customer is somewhat a council, but it's also like the people who ride our scooters. So being able to cater for both and having a, you know, fun, fast service for customers, but then, you know, showing councils that we can still focus on safety and make this a safe service mm -hmm. is quite important for us. It's yeah. really hard, eh? Because like with the helmet thing, yeah. you have to trust the public to leave the helmet. It's yeah. so frustrating to see them like amazing and sparkly, sparkly and you with the helmet attached. And then they're just like, who do you, do you have any idea where this stuff goes? <laughs> well, we, we actually don't deploy um, helmets on our scooters yet. It's sort of a, a juggle between, um, you know, the convenience of having a helmet right there and then all the other factors like hygiene and stuff. So um, at this stage, we just have helmets that you can order through the app um, for free. And then um, we send them out from our warehouse here in Wellington, um, looking into sort of other solutions where we can lock the helmets um, to the scooters so that kind of prevent that environmental impact where, you know, all around the world, e-scooter companies are losing thousands and thousands of helmets a day um, because, yeah, people just aren't wanting to wet, share a helmet with another person, which I think probably is a little bit topical at the moment, um, especially um, in post-COVID world. Um, you know, the, I guess that hygiene stuff is, is a much higher priority for people while they're not about. Um, but, yeah, the, uh, we always say, you know, Safety, that's the main value that we provide for councils and being able to influence the way that people um, ride on micro-mobility devices and, you know, e-scooters. So, yeah, it's definitely the, the our main and highest priority at all times is um, safety. But obviously when it comes to, yeah, things like helmets, it's always a bit of a juggling act. Cool. Um, I think the next question might be, what have you learned? Uh, what were your plans moving forward? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What are your plans? So I think for the future of Flamingo, a big focus for us is, you know, sustainability. So we have a new model of scooter. So this is a swappable battery that can be taken in and out of the scooter. And then using things like cargo e-bikes to move around and swap these batteries out on scooters. So rather than vans collecting and charging scooters each night, our team can, you know, effectively get around carbon neutral on e-bikes and swapping out these batteries. Yeah. Um, and then focusing a lot more on technology and how we can use that, to, um, you know, like augmented reality parking and yeah, um, machine learning on parking photos, be able to detect how people are parking scooters. And then, yeah, I guess another big area is growth for us looking to get into the Australian market as well. Cool. Um, everything's a little bit up in the air at the moment just with um, COVID for sure I think we had a, a little bit of a slide on COVID so obviously it was crazy um, having to initiate these emergency plans that we'd always had in place in case there was a natural disaster or um, something popped up but um, you know just to actually need to need to collect every single scooter and bring them back to base um, within 24 48 hours I think the councils gave us was a was a crazy thing and um you know when we first relaunched following COVID we had these new requirements in place where we had to sanitize the scooters so um it was crazy the first week a few weekends back because I think the whole country you know that had the, had this cabin fever and then all of a sudden they were out they were keen they were riding the scooters and our our poor team were out every every day spraying the scooters trying to follow the riders around because um we had systems in place where the scooter would actually disable and it wasn't available for riders until one of our team could come along and give it a good um, clean down, wipe down and sanitize it and mark it off as being ready um, to ride again for the public. So it was like at the start, it was crazy. We were sort of um, struggling to keep up with that rush of demand because, um, you know, people couldn't ride the scooters until they'd been cleaned again. Um, and even now we've got such an increased focus on cleaning the scooters and sanitizing them as they come through. So that was, I guess that was a big challenge. And now, now we're sort of at the other side. It's awesome here in um, New Zealand, but I guess the growth overseas growth for the time being seems to be difficult to say the least. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. And probably the other providers are really struggling with that. Yeah. Well, it's, it seemed like, um, you know, one thing that council loves is our, the council's love is how quickly we can kind of adapt to challenges. So we were able to get a full sanitization system running um, during during lockdown so that when we did come into alert level two, I think it was, or three, I don't know, we moved, we moved alert level so quickly. Um, we kind of had this really um, high, highly advanced system ready to go. So that, that's it there on the right side of the screen. Um, that's all the scooters that are waiting to be sanitized in Auckland. Um, so yeah, no, it, it was um, sort of, that's one area I guess that um, we try to work, you know, the council is kind of the key stakeholder. So uh, we do everything we can to sort of adapt quickly and show that we, you know, one, take safety seriously, but also because we are this kind of local company here in New Zealand, we're able to adapt what we do and kind of, um, yeah, cha change and adapt to challenges really, really quickly. Who, who is sanitizing the scooters? So we've got an awesome team of um, scooter operators. They kind of do an all-rounder job where they um, help drop off and pick up scooters, but they're also out on the street um, keeping an eye on riders and picking up scooters that are fallen over or not parked in the best place. And then, of course, also back at the warehouse, um, repairing the scooters and making sure that they're safe. Um, so I guess that's another area is... Um, you know, we've got all the, the apps for the customers and then we've also got, you know, the whole other side of the app where for our staff members who are out and about either charging the scooters or repairing the scooters. So every 30 days, um, scooters will disable and come up for collection. So um, the team kind of have a map similar to what you see there, but um, where, you know, there's scooters that need to be picked up or if they get reported by the public for being damaged or even if um, they get two one star reviews in a row, they get flagged for the team to take a look and make sure that that scooter, um, you know, is all good, safe and ready to go for the next rider. I would wonder why they'd give a scooter a one star, <laughs> like if it's not broken. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, sometimes they don't write a comment or anything. So if it gets two one-star reviews, um, it gets disabled. No one else can write it until our team comes along and takes a look. Yeah, sometimes it's just <laughs> they, they thought it was slow or, they, you know, it could be anything. But sometimes, you know, it means that there's something wrong with the scooter and needs to be repaired. Cool. Awesome. Righty. I think we can move to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, so if you could choose three things, these, like, yeah, what are your top three learnings? Awesome. So the first one we've got there is resilience. I think, you know, it's kind of cliche, everyone says it, but to never give up um, has been a huge one for us. So I think, you know, that, you know, as humans, you kind of always overestimate your competition and underestimate yourself. And we've had to really learn not to do that. Um, with, you know, we're competing with these huge multinational companies um, and we've really had to kind of dig deep and kind of prove to ourselves that we can compete with them and that we are actually, you know, even though we maybe don't have the same resources that we can, that we're better than we think and we, we, we've kind of got this sort of thing. Um, I think a big part of that has just been, you know, the power that comes from creating really specific goals and setting tight timelines to achieve what we want to achieve. So, you know, we, we always, um, we kind of thrive off that really short timeline. So, you know, leading up to launch, we only had 12 weeks, as Nick was saying before, to get a whole product and the whole, you know, the whole Flamingo ready to go. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, work always kind of like expands the amount of time you give it. So when you, when that, when that time frame's really short and you're kind of forced um, to kind of, kind of work as quickly as you can, that's, that's where we really thrive. And similar while we were in lockdown, we decided to, um, launch Flamingo Food. So, um, a restaurant partner with restaurants to deliver food, similar concept to, Uber Eats and you know when you really set your mind to it and um, ensure that you're using your time um, effectively we always kind of surprise ourselves how much we can achieve in a short space of time 
And um, yeah, I think we kind of thrive off that mad rush that we have to do that, that kind of leads to the best results sometimes. Um, and then, yeah, the second one we've got there is how to enter second or third to market. So like I was saying before, we always kind of had this dream of bringing these to this company and being first to market, but um, Lime, Lime and some of the other operators beating us to it meant that we've had to learn a lot about how to enter a market behind, you know, second or third. Um, so uh, we've kind of learned how important it is to set a clear marketing goal. So obviously when we first entered the market, that goal was customer acquisition. So that's the only thing we focused on when we were doing our marketing efforts, every single thing, um, any, every single marketing tactic needed to achieve the goal of, of customer acquisition. So um, we would trial lots of different marketing tactics, test and measure every single one. So, um, you know, <laughs> people, so many people will come to us trying to sell us, you know, brand awareness or marketing. And it's like, you know, you can really go back down to the basics. Yeah. If you give me a dollar <laughs> and you, and you can turn it into, and I get more than a dollar back, then we'll do it all day, every day. You know, we'll make, we'll do this for as long as we can sort of thing. So, um, sort of the, when it comes to marketing, the importance of starting really small and then what works really pump a lot of effort and um, I guess resources into that initiative. So uh, what, in, in saying that, what worked? Well, we've really found um, social media in particular is so powerful and cost effective um, to advertise through social media. So the likes of Facebook and Instagram and um, yeah, we've sort of learned different camp what different campaigns seem to have the best results. So um, I guess one thing we always do when we launch uh, like a new Facebook campaign is A-B, A-B testing. So running two versions of the same sort of ad um, with a slight variant and then seeing which version um, has the best results. And then you can sort of keep tweaking it from there and there to ensure that you know, the final version of the ad is the most effective and the most cost effective as well. Um, Some of the, I guess, the campaigns we've had the best results with have been um, where they kind of tie quite nicely into our app. So, for example, we ran a treasure hunt around each of the three cities where people had to, um, we just had phantom posters you know the little um kind of not not full billboards or anything but just the posters you you see around the city um and they had qr codes on them that had to be scanned through the app um and so when people went around they got a certain number of free minutes um as part of the treasure hunt and that was hugely effective for getting new customers to sort of um give flamingo a go and because of that uh, that kind of i guess um yeah just activity of going out and about and getting some free minutes and um the, you know tying it into the app so they had to download the app in order to participate in the treasure hunt yeah because yeah i think you know one thing that surprised us is just how big of a barrier it can be for people to download an app like oh i've already got lime i've already got um you know another e-scooter company like why do i want to download another one sort of thing we kind of never expected that to be quite the barrier that it has been in some cities that we've launched behind, um, you know, big established e-scooter companies. Cool. And the third one there is build a high performing team. Yeah. So I think similar to what I said before with the investors, like it's really important to have the same, the same vision. So we've, um, you know, spent a lot of time getting the team right, making sure that we've got a, a group of both staff members, but also, um, business advisors who kind of believe in that same vision of, of ours um, and kind of come along for the journey sort of thing and kind of share in that journey and, and, and the kind of the ups and the downs along the way. Um, and yeah, just when it comes to, I guess, advisors and, um, you know, kind of, I guess, specialists who can help with different areas of the business, we've always kind of aligned ourselves with the best of the best like we think it's really important to have um really people who are experts in their fields to kind of help with each area of the business um and yeah we've been so lucky with the i guess the support we've had through different um different groups like creative hq and different um kind of um connections that we have throughout 
um, Wellington and Auckland and Christchurch um, to sort of, yeah, build a really high performing team who kind of share that same, same goal as us. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So um, I think the next one is what support <clears throat> do you wish to get from councils? So I guess what we'd like to see is this greater support for micromobility. <clears throat> Sometimes I like to think about it that if, you know, this was the dawn of the road, how would you split it up between cars, buses, public transport, bikes and scooters, you know? You know, a lot of people, you know, might hate on e-scooters being on footpaths, but, you know, look how much space cars take up and how many people they move around. One thing we really like is, you know, parklets. Uh, we can park e-scooters. You know, you could fit 20 e-scooters for one car, which is amazing amount of space and how those people can all move individually still um, and yeah there's more dedicated kind of lanes for cycling and scooting which helps you know split up the kind of free speeds of how people move around the cities cool um and so you're in the micro mobility sector at the moment are there any other industries that you're interested in kind of getting into um i guess we're both pretty interested in the transport and technology industry um, micro mobility industry moves so fast that you know it's almost working in a new kind of space all the time it feels like it feels like we're just on the edge of it still barely even in it ourselves and how fast it's moving so yeah I guess for now we're pretty happy to keep seeing where this place goes and how we can make it better cool and do you need any help from us <laughs> Well, definitely um, ride a local e-scooter company when you do um, want to have a fun, safe and easy way to get around town. Um, I think, you know, we're always looking for experts in their field fields for different areas of the business, like I was saying before. Um, and we're always, you know, getting help from um, lots of different kind of contacts and um, advisors. So, yeah, yeah. Any, any any help is always very much appreciated. <laughs> oh, um, so that's basically please use Flamingo above any other provider. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay, so support, there's support, actually... Support local, yeah. <laughs> support local, yeah, if you can. Definitely. Um, yeah. There's 17 questions, so I'm definitely going to start reading some of them out. How long does it take for a scooter to pay itself off? Ooh, that's an interesting question. It's it's um it's different in each city just because we sort of operate in different um, environments in each city. So at the moment in Wellington, we're lucky enough to be the only operator at the moment. Um, just following um, COVID, jump didn't come back to the street, so we've kind of found ourselves in a Monopoly and then up in Auckland um, there's kind of the most operators where we operate alongside Neuron and Beam at the moment and usually Jump as well and then down in Christchurch it's um, an interesting kind of market where Lime has the the kind of the main the big share of the um, allocation they've got a thousand scooters whereas we only have 300 and so does Beam um, so uh, there's a kind of, I guess, different factors that come into account, kind of hard to give an exact amount of days or months um, because it has, we have had very different, um, I guess, marketing, operating conditions um, in each city. Um, but I don't know, stab in the dark, you want to give them a stab in the dark? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it, it varies a lot, sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, I guess we'll just have to imagine. <laughs> uh, so Noah Williams has asked, what do you do with scooters that have reached the end of their life or broken beyond repair? So yeah, I guess we always try and keep our operations as sustainable as possible. We try and purchase like a lot of spare parts um, and we use everything we can. So if anything breaks on a scooter, we swap it out with a new part to try and keep yeah, them going. Anything that can't be used, we kind of break it down and recycle it properly into like metals and plastics and what can't be reused. Mm. Yeah, so we're really proud of the, I guess, the um, sustainability side of the product. You know, the whole point of micromobility is to provide an environmentally friendly alternative to cars. So part of that needs to be um, the maintenance and repair side of it as well. So 
that's something we take really seriously and we're really proud of um yeah the the processes that the, our team follow when it comes to end of life and recycling and also reusing um as much as possible but also as much as safe as is safe <laughs> cool uh, the next question is, I really want to hear about branding, how it came about and plans for the brand in the future. The Flamingo name. Like, yeah. were you at the zoo or? <laughs> <laughs> no, because we were trying to think of like, we wanted a word that people would go, oh, rider there. So like, rider flamingo there. And I guess we went through a few animals and I guess the flamingo kind of had a long neck, kind of like a scooter has a long neck. And then, yeah, the, you know, people don't really associate flamingo is native to any kind of country you know it's kind of in pop culture as a cool animal it's a vibrant pink which makes them great to be seen out on the streets <laughs> so are you planning to well yeah you're going to have to keep using it yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're quite happy with the flamingo brand yeah for sure yeah <laughs> cool. um so this is a little bit similar but slightly different what's the lifetime of a scooter what happens to decommissioned scooters so do you have any figures on the lifetime, approximate lifetime? So it does vary again, but um, you know, we do still have scooters in operation that have been out from the start and that's just through the, um, you know, both the preventative maintenance we've had in place and also just the very regular um, upkeep and making sure that they've got new parts. So, you know, there, there, there wouldn't be any scooter out there that sort of hasn't had something on it replaced. Um, since launch but um i guess yeah we've been lucky enough with kind of the the initial scooter even if it's had a you know a new motor a new battery a new um controller whatever put on it we've sort of been able to keep keep them going and extend that lifetime by um repairing and replacing parts on them so um yeah for a lot of the scooters i guess we haven't found that that kind of lifetime um cut off point it's sort of they just keep going like Mad Max, like <laughs> 2030, they'll be like beating up Flamingo scooters. I mean, like, I'd say that there'd be some scooters out there that are completely rebuilt from spare parts just because they're so componentized into their parts that we'd be able to replace them out as each part wears out. So an old scooter might effectively just be a new scooter now because how many parts have been swapped out over the last few months when they wear out. Yeah, yeah. So who is creating these new, like, who do, are you guys doing it or do you have someone on your team that's doing it so we have a team of mechanics in each city and our warehouses where we have all of our kind of spare parts and they kind of swap out and work on scooters every day cool they've been impressive um, if we're maintaining all the scooters in the three cities <laughs> with hindsight what are your thoughts on choosing segway as a supplier <laughs> segway has been um it was a really like i said before really great um kind of brand name and credible supplier to use for those council applications um and kind of brings brings that name of segway kind of brings a lot of credibility which was great for convincing the councils and we we are definitely happy to be associated with segway there um focusing on innovation a lot and so both our first and second generation of scooter were from segway and they've sort of got a lot in the pipeline as well and they've got they kind of take we deal with them quite closely so we're always in close communication with them they sort of ask us what they what we'd like to see on future scooters and also on the firmware and everything else so they have been um yeah really great um partner and sort of they're looking forward to kind of developing new scooters as well. Cool. Um, what's the tech stack that powers the platform? <laughs> so I guess we, all our client systems run on Google App Engine, built with Node and MySQL. Cool. Um, how much capital did you require to let Flamingo embark? What was your funding journey like? Yeah, so we spoke a little bit about the funding at the start, just um, how it was quite chicken and egg and we had to kind of um, get investors on board on the basis that we do obtain a license in each um, city. And we've sort of gone through a couple of, um, two rounds of raising just because all those cities kind of did come on so quickly. Um, 
where we yeah launched in Auckland and Wellington both in June 2019 and then Christchurch three months later. Um, so yeah, I guess you know you can you can probably <laughs> do the math as well as we can that um, that we operate about 1,300 scooters across the three cities and you know each each one can cost up to you know a thousand dollars um to get it all set up and um and with the you know the systems that we need in order to have it ready for sharing but also the brand and everything else on it so yeah yeah cool um there's another one here hi guys what impulsed you to start another scooter company despite having a well-established brand like line so you were already in development before Lime even got here. So yeah, it was kind of just start speeding up when they were yeah. they were there, not starting from scratch. Cause yeah, you could have been the first, you know, I guess it's hard when you're starting anything because they have so much more resource and speed. Yeah, I think one thing for us was that, you know, we kind of bit Lime to Wellington. So we were the, one of the first scooter companies in Wellington. So it's not, kind of interesting market that you have to deal with a council and obtain a permit to operate so it's not necessarily you know who's got the most money to get their first bits who can kind of have the most compelling um proposal to councils which is kind of what help does and how we work and everything yeah yeah do the scooters themselves contain any gps technology or is it all done on the rider's phone so yeah the scooters do have on this little box here a little gps antenna in the top along with like a um their own SIM card and yeah, this, yeah, normal IoT device. But yeah, we do use cell phone GPS as well alongside the school GPS just to get the best signal. Cool. Um, would you consider getting into the shared e-bike market? Oops. That is an interesting one. It's something we've kind of um, discussed in the past. It's not, I guess it's not an immediate plan and sort of the trends overseas we've largely seen um, e-scooters kind of over be the step after e-bikes um, or bike sharing. So um, yeah, I think it, it, bikes can be one that lots of people have kind of struggled to make um, profitable and to kind of get working really, really well. Um, it's kind of doesn't have the same convenience as just jumping on a scooter and um, scooting off. But yeah, never say never. It's, we're definitely open to um, you know, allowing the Flamingo app to offer different modes of transport for sure. Cool. Um, Benjamin has asked, could you give an idea of how many people you have working in operations in Flamingo cities? Yeah. So in each um, city, we've got about a staff of about 10 um, doing that general operations. Then, of course, we also have um, customer support staff developers and um, people that sort of work across all three cities. And then um, we have an awesome team of Flamingo feeders is what we call them. So third party contractors who pick up and charge the scooters each night, give them a safety check and get them back on the street first thing in the morning, ready to go again. And I'd say, you know, to date we've signed up over 200 Flamingo feeders. It's sort of a role where um, people kind of come and go. It's very flexible. They might just work a couple of nights a week. It's usually, um, you know, it's a gig economy role where people use it as a second source of income just to earn a little bit of extra money on the side. Um, so, you know, at, at, at this stage, we'd probably have about um, just over 50 across the country who are kind of consistently feeding flamingos um, throughout the week. Cool. The scooter bike sharing market is a competitive one. What were some defensive and or offensive tactics that you explored when competing with the likes of Lime, Onzo and Uber? Did you go and like um, disable or disable? Throw, throw them in the sea like everyone else? <laughs> no, no, ne never do that. In fact, <laughs> we were both in um, Sydney uh, back before COVID and now we were getting made fun of because we were around and about picking up scooters that had uh, picking up scooters, no, not scooters, bikes that had fallen over. So we're, we're big supporters of micro mobility. We're always um, keen to see it work in all cities and our, our team, when they're out on the street, they're picking up not just our scooters, but the scooters of other 
operators because um, you know we really do want e-scooters and micro mobility to work for the city as a whole. And if you know when things like that, if they win, the whole um, kind of system wins. So we don't play dirty, but um, yeah, I guess you know it kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the start, where we tried a lot of different marketing tactics, um, and the key, I guess, measure or driver or KPI that we were working towards was customer acquisition. So um, it certainly, yeah, was, was the big thing to, you know, win over customers from those other operators when we entered behind them and, um, and sort of, yeah, sit, sort of kind of get people over that barrier of downloading the app. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the big thing was to sort of um, run different social media campaigns and things, you know, when people were on their phone already, um, maybe not when they're right near a scooter, but get that, get that Flamingo app downloaded in advance so that next time they're in a rush or next time they want to get somewhere quickly and there's a scooter there, they're all ready to go. Cool. How many Ks a day will a high use scooter cover? <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, Kilometers. Um, well, the average um, scooter trip is about nine minutes. Um, next, having a look now to see if we can find that exact statistic. And, um, you know, it's different in each city, but on a good day, you know, a scooter could get four, five, six rides a day. Um, so, yeah. If anyone wants to do the math on how far you can get in nine minutes, um, they the average speed is around about, you know, 15, 20 Ks. So there you go. <laughs> um, why do you think you were awarded a license in Auckland when Lyme wasn't? <laughs> well, we'll probably have to leave that question for Auckland Council, but um, we, we can say what they said at the time, which was that um, they believed Flamingo had a higher safety profile then um, the operators who were not successful, worded very carefully there. Um, so no, we really do focus on um, how we can improve the safety of not just our riders, but also pedestrians and other users on the road. So um, like I've said, like, safety is the value, the biggest value that we offer to council. Um, and it's, it's always the top priority with everything we do. So there was a number of, um, you know, safety initiatives we have, like the free helmets that our customers can order through the app, um, the safety zones. So we've got areas throughout Auckland and all the all the cities where, um, you know, you can't ride a scooter. The scooter, if you enter it, the scooter will um, slow down and stop working or low speed zones where the scooter will slow down to a certain speed, as well as no parking zones. Um, where if you try to end your ride there, it will ask you to relocate your scooter to somewhere else. Uh, we also review the parking photos that everyone takes at the end of, um, end of their ride to ensure that our parking compliance or the parking compliance of our users is um, kept to the requirements of each council. Um, and then, yeah, just having our team out on the street monitoring kind of how the scooters are parked, but also how people are riding, um, running the safety events. What else do we do? A lot of sort of um, safety initiatives and some new ones kind of that we're working on at the moment as well, where um, to encourage yeah, the use of helmets and, and also proper parking. I think Auckland Council in particular is one that's had a stronger focus on um, parking and the nuisance, they call it nuisance, caused by having um, e-scooters on the footpath. Cool. Um, Aaron Scott has asked, um, hey Nick and Jackson, firstly a great story for two young people and congrats on, congrats on year one of Flamingo. What do you think is the biggest challenge in your market in the coming 12 to 18 months for micro mobility and Flamingo? Um, it's hard to know. Apart from COVID? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I guess it's such an adapting space. I mean, we saw bikes kind of take over the world and then scooters take over the world. I mean, what will be next and how can we adapt to stay the kind of mode that people want to ride? I'd say would be an interesting one. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what's your exit strategy? Mm -hmm. 
Well, we kind of went into Flamingo not with a really um, predefined exit strategy, but it's obviously something that we've had to consider as part of our, um, our I guess, business plan and um, long-term strategy and it's something that we've, um, you know, had to discuss with investors. Um, definitely a, a wide range of um, options we're open to and probably would be a form of acquisition or um, merger. Cool. Can you talk about how you both decided to partner up and work together? Uh, how do your skills complement each other? <laughs> oh. Everyone wants to know whether you fight. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, I guess I have a bit of a tech background and Jackson's got quite a good business, legal accounting kind of background. So balances out what we each good at in the business. <laughs> Comics and yeah, as I said, we've met at um, Venture Up program and kind of kept in touch. Yeah, <laughs> stuck together now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no looking back now. Yeah, so Nick, you know, Nick worked for a few years in software development. And I worked for a few years at a, um, a business advisor and accounting firm or a couple of them actually. So yeah, like we definitely had those um, skills that complemented each other. And I guess we had that shared passion of startups when we... Um, met at venture up and we sort of we're always kind of bouncing ideas off each other and coming up with um different startup ideas and like like we said at the start we tried tr tried quite a few before we sort of um came across flamingo and sort of that was the one that took off and yeah never looked back <laughs> we don't we we're, actually don't fight too often we've definitely learned how to um how to so. yeah how to put up with each other <laughs> If you met in Venture Up, it's my understanding that Venture Up is for teens. Yeah, accelerated. You, so you were teenagers when you started working on Flamingo. No, no. So we met and worked on a different startup at Venture Up, and then that one didn't really go anywhere. And then over the years, we've just you know dabbled around with ideas, and then eventually a few years later, you know. Like, Three or four years later, came up with Flamingo. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. We were 21 when we started Flamingo, and lots of the newspapers like to put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I, I'm not even going to share what I was doing at 21. <laughs> Definitely wasn't anything contributing to society. Um, in terms of attracting investors' money, how do you convey that you're not the same as the other scooter brands? So yeah, at the start, like we always had the um, that key focus on safety. I guess a lot of the investors were seeing how other e-scooter operators were going about business, and they definitely saw that differentiator of having a collaborative, um, a collaborative relationship with councils and provide and focusing on safety as a really important differentiator. Um, and I guess yeah, the big thing was being able to um, get that funding on the basis of having a license or a permit. So like what Nick said before, it's quite a unique um, unique market where that, that, I guess, permission or ability to operate is kind of like a golden ticket where if you are able to um, obtain a, a permit or a license from the council, then, um, you know, you're kind of good to go. <laughs> awesome. Do you see a big variance in maintenance and or recharge schedules depending on the weather? Yeah, the weather, big thing that affects it. Not so much the temperature, more just rain that affects it. But yeah, you can often tell quite easily. I mean, we sit in the back of a warehouse most of the time with no windows. So our kind of weather forecast is you know, how our financial forecast looks for the day. <laughs> Yeah, weather has a big, big factor, probably bigger than we thought it would at the start. Um, but unsurprisingly, no one, no one sort of wants the scooter around for, um, for that recreational purpose um, when it's rainy. And we see the kind of the average ride length drop down as well. So weather has a big factor. And um, yeah, we're sort of in, into our big full, our first full winter this year but it kind of got disturbed anyway by COVID so <laughs> yeah cool uh next question is from Hana hey Hana how is the food service going was the uptake good what are the challenges 
Yeah, it was awesome when we first came out of um, alert level three. You know, the the goal was our scooters couldn't be on the street. We couldn't be helping people move around easier. So what what? How can we use the scooters to instead bring things to people? Um, and yeah, it was awesome at the start. Um, the food industry, I guess, in New Zealand's one that's really tightly knit, and they they were hugely supportive of a local company kind of shaking up the food delivery market um, and providing an alternative to Uber Eats that um, offers a fairer rate for, or a fairer price for both the restaurants and the customers. So we, we were really happy with the number of um, restaurants we've had come on board. We've got um, almost 200 restaurants on the platform so far. And I guess that's been the main thing to um, get that customer number up as well, because, you know, customers, when they're ordering their food, they want, they want choice and op- lots of different options. So um, it's been an interesting market to sort of balance. Like there's the, the customers and the restaurants and then also the, Drivers. Um, the drivers who, or the delivery. Fl- the delivery partners who either ride the scooters or drive their own um, cars or other vehicles to deliver each um, each food order. So, you know, if there's not enough orders, then the restaurants and the um, drivers get upset. And then if there's too many orders, it can kind of, it's hard to balance. So it's sort of, I guess the biggest challenge has been growing each of those three main pillars at the right um, rate and kind of different We've tried, we've tried kind of different um, initiatives to try to balance different um, pillars. Cool. Um, so if anyone has anything they need, post it in the Q&A. Um, we're just about at eight. I think we can go a little bit over time, um, ask a few more of these. We've got six more questions. So maybe we will try and power through some of these last questions. Right. Sure um, <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> Have you trialed subscription models in any of your cities? We haven't yet. No, it's something we were um, thinking about doing before COVID and we kind of decided to focus on flamingo food instead. Um, Definitely something we're thinking about and looking into. Maybe good for the food delivery. Yeah, true. And maybe um, being able to link them up. So if you order with flamingo food, maybe you could get some, you know, minutes with scooters and vice versa. Next one is, what other safety improvements that you've introduced on the scooters themselves? I noticed the mechanical brakes on the Gen 2 are better than the Gen 1 motor brakes. Yeah, I guess our first generation scooter's got a multi-brake system, so they have an electronic brake at the front and a step brake at the back. But yeah, our Gen 2 scooter does have a handbrake as well. Um, yeah, just a handbrake, which also activates the electronic brake on the back wheel. So yeah, those are kind of improvements that we like to make and yeah, from a lot of user feedback and what people are used to like to bring out and I think we'll probably be phasing in more of the handbrake scooters. Next is was the decision to suspend your services during COVID your decision alone or was the decision decision made for you? Made for us. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely you just were told to get them off. That was yeah. I think a lot of there's a lot of uncertainty in level three and level four <laughs> or yeah mainly level three. But yeah. Um, did you validate, so congratulations on Flamingo, did, how did you validate the idea before starting on making the product? <laughs> we actually looked back at this, um, just last week, we saw our very first smoke test video, which, um, or ad, which was a, a mock-up, um, video that we posted on Facebook to see how much, I guess, hype and interest there would be in electric scooter sharing arriving in New Zealand, um, which was kind of funny to look at. But in the end, like like we said before, we didn't have that much um, choice on the matter. Other operators were on their way to New Zealand, and we wanted to um, we wanted to be there along with them. Yeah, and we kind of looked at other cities around the world that were similar to New Zealand and how sharing economy worked over there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Cool. Um, so the next one is about if you're thinking of e-bikes or bikes like Onzo for some of us who like the relevance of some exercise. If not, why would that be? You did touch on bikes. What was the answer on bikes? Are you going to expand into them? I mean, it's a possibility. Like I said, never say never. But yeah, for now, we like to focus on just on e-scooters. We've got some new models coming out of e-scooters and kind of want to focus on getting that right and perfecting that. And then yeah, maybe one day we can look at other modes of transport and maybe that will be something totally different to bikes and scooters as well in the future. Awesome. 
And the final question is, do you ever plan on going worldwide? <laughs> I guess a lot of our initial plans have been to focus on firstly New Zealand and then the Australian market. Um, and that was something we were really hoping to do this year before the world kind of got flipped on, <laughs> on its head. Um, so yeah, we definitely um, think that we've created a service and a, you know, a business that can be expanded overseas. But um, I guess for now, we're definitely focusing on New Zealand and Australia as a first step. And we haven't, I guess, don't have any immediate plans to go worldwide um, too quickly, especially at the moment. <laughs> awesome. Well, we've reached the end. Um, thank you so much, Nick and Jackson, for that. It was amazing. Um, we will definitely upload the recording to somewhere. It might be like YouTube, so you can go back, watch yourselves talking. Um, and yeah, if anyone else wants to watch anything else or grab any more info, you can take a look at that video. Um, if anyone has any more questions, maybe just connect with you on LinkedIn. Yep, both on LinkedIn. Um, oh, there's one more. One more question. Lucky last. I think that's all. So, yeah. I'll catch you later, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>